According to data from the Reserve Bank, South Africa is seeing the longest streak of currency outflows on a quarterly basis since the five years through to September 1999. That, of course, culminated with an emerging markets crisis. After that, we saw a really big turnaround in the fortunes of the RAND and the South African economy. What is happening right now? This is The Moneymakers. I'm Bruce Whitfield. Tonight, we're talking about the reasons behind the massive cash outflows that South Africa is experiencing, and we're going to try and find out where the money is going. I'm joined from Cape Town by Anton van Teylingen. He is a Forex Operations Manager at Sable. And also with us, Sangeet Sunath, who is the Deputy Managing Director at Investec Asset Management. Anton, let's start with you, please, because you guys have noticed this huge switch in currency flows. This is 16 consecutive quarters of outflows from South Africa, paralleling and now beating the big outflows we saw in 1999. It goes a long way to explaining the state of the currency. What's your view? No, I completely agree. I think um, we started to see an uptick in the outflows uh, towards Q3 2015, um, uh, probably centered around a bit of political focus as well as, you know, there was talks about our output um, forecast being readjusted. Um, that followed forth into the final quarter 2015. Um, obviously, the Nantla Nene a deal whereby uh, the finance minister was let go uh, resulted in, in, in a massive outflow. Um, the, the correlation with that, um, which included the use of investment allowances, which ended on the 31st of December 2015, um, sort of resulted in, in, in large amounts of, of money leaving the country in, in an unprecedented amount. I mean, we had a, almost a perfect storm of events, didn't we, Anton, in terms of the, the politics of the country deteriorating with the shock sacking of the finance minister on the 9th of December. Um, yet investors had made up their, money, their minds already. They were concerned about looming ratings, downgrades. The mantra seemed the same. We weren't getting any sense of hope out of central government. But on 9-12, we saw the finance minister getting fired. Three or four days later, we see Prabhin Gordon coming back in. But not even that has been enough to give the, the RAND a stay of execution. Even in January and February and possibly March this year, those record levels of outflows have persisted. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think a the perfect storm is a perfect analogy. Um, you know, the firing of the finance minister, um, that included with the sort of us finding ourselves at the bottom of a commodity cycle. So, you know, you'd expect with a weakening currency for exports to tick up, but since prices are so low, it's not making up for, for what's required. And then obviously there's the emerging market focus. Um, I think, you know, on the back of China's China's troubles, and, you know, if you look at Brazil as a good example, um, if any economy sort of resembles our from a political and economic front, it's most likely Brazil, and we, we've seen very similar outflows for them. So, you know, all, all the factors come together to culminate um, in not giving investors uh, as well as individuals much confidence in the RAND at this point in time. And as you mentioned, we've seen large, dec large uh, increases in our outflows at the beginning of this year. We weren't expecting it um, to increase as much, but it seems as if as soon as the allowances were um, reset, um, you know, that outflow continued to happen um, yeah, up until this point. Yeah, and it's ironic, Anton, thank you very much, that we have seen a strengthening since those days in the RAND. Uh, Sangeet, I don't know if you go back as far as 1999 in your experience in markets, but then it was all about Thailand. There was an emerging markets crisis, I think, connected to Thailand. Uh, and we've seen a similar emerging markets crisis, this time with our BRICS chums dead uh, center of it, with Brazil in all kinds of bother, with Russia, with sanctions there, um, India's doing okay, uh, and the Chinese, of course, slowing. Have we been caught in this BRICS perfect storm rather than a per purely South Africa specific set of scenarios? Yeah, um, Bruce. Thanks. So, I mean, I think I think it's been a combination. Hey, I mean, you know, a, a lot of a lot of the studies have been done recently to try and understand uh, what has contributed to the RAND's weakness. Um, I think probably about six or nine months ago uh, when we looked at this, it was a, probably a combination of the emerging markets, the commodity cycle, and then, you know, a bit of us scoring our own goals, I guess, you know, and, and six or nine months ago, we probably attributed a third, a third to each of those three, three factors. I think scoring our own goals seemed to be leading the way in those, uh, in those three factors at the moment. Uh, we, you know, we're probably in the region of about 40% of, of our own goals really having a big impact on the, on, on the RAND and causing a lot of the weakness. Um, and, you know, I think, I think th that seems to be continuing, uh, you know, despite, despite the, the more recent uh, strength in the RAND. 
uh, which I think you know is, is largely driven by dollar weakness rather than necessarily us getting the right things done uh, in our domestic environment. Uh, and the reason you say that so much of what is happening in the currency markets is due to own goals is because we were by a long way the worst performing emerging market currency last year. So if all of the factors pertaining to emerging markets are held as equal, you then add the own goals into there and that then amplifies the underperformance of the RAND during 2015. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, th I think that's been that's certainly been the big component. And uh, you know, despite getting some of the things right, you know, I think there's still there's there's still a lot of weight being put to uh, to the political arena. And you know, it's it's probably it's probably more skewed in terms of um, of what we're doing in the political arena than it's ever been in South Africa. You know, I mean, politics hasn't played as big an impact uh, on our economy as as we've seen in the last few months. Um, and so, you know, hopefully we'd we'd see that 40% reducing in size, uh, but you know, there, there's no there's no clear steer to show us that 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 is actually the case at the moment. Okay, but as things stand, and looking at the way in which you're watching Investec asset management clients, their their currency flows, their portfolio flows, how has that changed over the last six to 12 months? Have you seen the cycles ebb and flow along with the sentiment that you've observed in the market? It hasn't been too different to what uh, to what Anton's been saying. You know, I mean, on the back uh, on the back of the third quarter last year, so around September, uh, we saw a fair amount of uh, of flows go offshore, and I guess it's it's two things. I mean, I, I think the RAND weakness is is a big contributor to that, and then I guess from our business perspective at Investec, I mean, you know, I think I think in times of stress and volatility like we've been experiencing, uh, you know, people tend to choose. Uh, managers who have a domestic presence but you know where there's sufficient expertise and experience and people who've seen multiple cycles um, so, so our increase in flows offshore you know is sort of related to the RAND and also related to people being more discerning in the type of managers they've, uh, they've chosen um, so, so you know the last quarter of last year was, was certainly a massive inflows into, into offshore funds um, I think what's been reassuring for us is, you know, in the past, probably five or six years ago, where we saw offshore flows, uh, investors tended to move into money market or bank deposits offshore. Um, and, you know, we've been big advocates of the fact that when you're going offshore, you know, you're taking a fair amount of risk on the currency to start with. Uh, and so you should be properly rewarded for that risk that you're taking. And so actually going into money market and bank deposits offshore, uh, you know, isn't an optimal use of that risk. So, so the encouraging behavior has been uh, investors actually going into global equity funds and going into global multi-assets, so, so balanced, traditional balance type of funds uh, in the last quarter of last year. So, so that's, that's been really good. Uh, it's a good change in behavior. And then, you know, the first quarter of this year, we've seen, we've seen an, an uptick of that from last year as well. So, so an even higher skewness towards offshore funds. Um, so to put some numbers to it, you know, I think, um, Last year, the, 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 the third quarter, uh, fourth quarter last year, we saw probably about 40% of the funds of money invested with investing asset management go offshore and 60 on the domestic side. Uh, in the first quarter of this year, uh, you know, we've seen 60% go offshore and 40% in domestic funds. I mean, that's an extraordinary um, statistic. Say, encouraging. Yeah, it's an extraordinary statistic to show the herd mentality of so many people. The, no the, the noise turns bad or the news turns all noisy, and we do see people start behaving with a very distinct herd mentality. Perhaps, Anton, it's something to do with the way in which financial advisors operate and the sort of guidance that they give their investors. It's, it's, it's typical of the cycle that we're in, that everybody turns negative at about the same time and starts to positive at about the same sort of time. Dare you, Anton, give us some kind of idea as to where the currency could see the year end. We've had some forecasts putting us closer to 19 than 15 and some daring to go to 12 and 13. Where's your view on this dastardly thing called the RAND? Yeah, I think uh, the RAND itself is quite a fickle currency. Um, uh, still yet to meet someone who's confident in, in predicting it. Um, yeah, and I agree with you. I think financial advisors are having a hard time um, sort of predicting the time. I think, you know, as I say, it's, it's, it's not the timing, timing of the market. Um, it's the time in the market. And I think it's important that, um, you know, you look at it from a long-term point of view. Um, I think what we're seeing here, um, as Sandeep said, is, you know, a, a, a nice reversion. Um, but obviously, a lot of that is U.S.-backed. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, we, we were back under 21. Um, we were sort of hitting close to 24 against the pound. Um, and that market reversion is slowly but surely taking place. We've also seen a, some positive signs sort of in the commodity index uh, with some iron ore data showing that, you know, things could be getting better. But I think up until we, we get a clear answer from the ratings um, agencies about, you know, what the future of South Africa's um, bonds look like, um, I think uh, there's still going to be quite a bit of uncertainty floating around. And that uncertainty then, Sangeet, is going to stick around for a long time because we may survive a ratings downgrade in June. We may even survive one in December. But if we do survive the chop in both June and December, it'll simply be uncertain on a six-month basis after that, even if we do get our political, economic and the public-private partnership ducks in a row that we so desperately need. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think th there's, there's certainly going to be a lot of volatility and uncertainty, and, and it's actually difficult for, for financial advisors to navigate. So, you, you know, you've got, a, you've got a feel for them. I mean, I think, you know, what's critical is that, is that people need to ensure that they don't panic. You know, I mean, that's really the true benefit of a, of a financial advisor. And I think these conditions are going to separate, you know, average financial advisors from the really good ones. Um, and if people don't panic and, you know, you sort of stick to, to you know the key or, or the core of what people are trying to achieve, you know you, you should be able to construct portfolios that you know that out trumps uh, volatility. You know I mean if you built a good portfolio to start with, you know you you should sail through these type of volatile volatile conditions. But you know we we all know that that's a little bit easier said than done. But we look at the data, the data seems to suggest that South Africans have been panicking and they've been panicking in greater numbers, particularly uh, over the last three to four months. The good news about the panicking and taking money offshore is that I think structurally South Africans are a bit underweight in terms of their allocation offshore. Uh, you know, so we, we know we've got uh, uh, prudential regulations which require that investors don't invest more than 25% offshore. You know, there's a number of academic studies that you look at that, uh, that shows that if you're investing for the long term, you know, five plus years and you're targeting, you know, a, a, or you've got the risk appetite to target inflation plus seven or eight percent, you probably should, should allocate in the region of 40 to 50% offshore. Um, and, you know, historically investors partly for prudential reasons and regulatory reasons, and partly because they've been a bit nervous about going offshore, have under allocated towards offshore. Uh, so, so the panic has actually in, in some way resulted in a, you know, in a, in a more normalized uh, offshore allocation. Thank you. I'm going to leave it there. Sangeet Suna, thank you, the Deputy Managing Director at Investec Asset Management. Also to Anton von Thalingen, who is the Forex Operations Manager at Sable. Yeah, it is ironic, isn't it? Here we have a situation in South Africa where for years the Rand was trading comfortably around 650 to 7, 750 to the dollar. Did anybody take money out then? Well, a couple of clever people did, but the mantra ran dry and suddenly we've seen dramatic currency devaluation and then everybody runs for the door at the same time. These cycles come and go. How long the nick of the cycle for the currency is going to be, of course, is a difficult one. Does it ever go back to 650 to 7? Nobody's calling it there, and very few people are calling it close to 12 to 13 by the end of this year. But you're seeing a growing number of voices of people who are prepared to stick their head above that parapet. The year will tell. There'll be more money stories and money makers next time on The Money Makers. Thank you so much for watching. Good night.